<laughs> so um, let me welcome everybody. So good evening to some of you, including, for example, one of our speakers today, Lucas Lim, who is calling in from Singapore. Good afternoon to most of you and good morning for the colleagues who call in from the East Coast. We welcome you to the first intergenerational arbitration symposium, specifically a symposium dedicated to the overall issues of procedural issues in international arbitration. Now, before we start with the various panels, allow me to say a few words what this is about. This is the first of a series of symposia that we will hold when I say we, I say, of course, um, New York University Center for Transnational Litigation, Arbitration and Commercial Law, as well as Sciences Po Law School. It is an, something that is based on an idea that uh, Professor Diego Fernandez Arroyo had a year and a half back. The idea is to allow younger scholars to discuss their papers with more experienced practitioners and scholars. The idea is to offer a forum where to critically be able to get one's view assessed in order, of course, to get positive or at least constructive criticism on one's paper to make it perfect. So I thank uh, Professor Diego Fernandez Arroyo once again, not only for initiating this, but also for insisting on this first symposium that we are holding today in a time when many of us would have thought of other things to do. I really thank him for insisting because this is something that in the future, NYU and Sciences Po Law School will continue to do. Hopefully, we will be able to invite you to New York and Paris at one point. And the idea is also to open up the floor to younger scholars from other law schools. It is by chance that this year we have two speakers from NYU, as well as two speakers who have a link to Sciences Po. But the idea really is to open this to other universities, to allow people from all over the world to participate. This is basically a trial run. And I have to say, it looks like a very successful trial run. I say that in light of the papers I have seen. So thank you for, of course, the panelists. Thank you for the debaters and moderators. Thank you, of course, for the audience. But thank you, first of all, to Professor Diego Fernandez Arroyo. Now, I do not want to take too much time because time here is of the essence. As you have seen, we will start this afternoon with state and institutional perspectives. We have two speakers. One is Lucas Lim. He graduated from NYU earlier this year and now is back in Singapore. He presents a paper that, or a shorter version of which, has won a prize in an international writing competition, and the longer version of which will be published in the beginning of next year in a book I'm editing on the New York Convention. In fact, the book, the entire book that will be coming out early next year is on the autonomous versus domestic interpretation of the New York Convention, and Lucas Lim contributed with a paper he's presenting today on whether the concept of procedure to be found in Article 3 of the New York Convention is indeed to be interpreted autonomously or domestically. Then we'll talk a little more about an institutional perspective. In fact, it will be Rafael Menezes who will discuss Article 6 specifically of the ICC rules, actually specific Article 6.3 and 6.4, how they interact, what the court actually can do to promote the rationale behind these two provisions. 
I also want to thank Professor Giuditta Cordero Moss from Oslo University, who has been with us, and when I say us, with NYU and Sciences Po, I mean for many years, has contributed both to books and conferences that we all have um, organized um, across the Atlantic. Also thanks for the moderator, and with that I will actually leave you in Alexandra's hands. Um, Alexandra has a PhD from Sciences Po, and um, he is also the one who allows it to be online today. Without him, we would not be here. So thank you, Alexandra, and with that again, thank to everybody who's participating, but thanks to those who him to um, the person, Diego, who had the idea, but also to the panelists for being there, to the debaters and the moderator. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Franco, for, for uh, introducing all of this. And I guess the only housekeeping issue I would like to raise is that you can all ask questions in the chat um, directly, and we will collect them. That will be the role of, uh, of the two moderators today. And uh, well, for this, first of all, I'd like to thank you for the honor of being the moderator for this first, first panel of the first uh, intergenerational arbitration symposium. So um, as you will have seen, we have two different topics, procedural, but two different topics and two um, different perspectives. And we have decided with the speakers that we would deal with them one after the other. Um, and I would propose that we start um, perhaps in the logical order, that is with uh, the, the, the presentation by uh, Rafaela, giving us the, the institutional perspectives as it deals obviously with the issue of um, uh, objections to, um, to the jurisdiction of a tribunal. So Rafaela, um, I would like to give you the floor for the, the presentation and then we will be able to have the discussion as, uh, as agreed. Thank you, everyone. Uh, before before I, I begin, I just wanted to say thank you again to all of the organizers for this wonderful initiative, uh, in particular, and uh, not by order of pre preference, uh, Professor Diego Fernandez Arroyo for, for the invitation. Professor Franco Ferrari, also thank you very much for your, for your invitation. Um, I would like to thank uh, Professor Cordero Moss uh, for taking the time to, to, to be our our, so to speak, our challenge here in what we're going to be discussing, and uh, Alexander for your moderation. Lucas, it's a pleasure to, to, to share this panel with you. Uh, before I begin, I also wanted to just make a small disclaimer. I'm going to be discuss, discussing more my practice and what I see at the court and at ICC. I've been told that I should keep this at under 10 minutes, which as the stereotypical Latin that I am, it's going to be quite hard, but I'm going to try my best. Um, so um, to begin with, uh, we're gonna look at article 6.3 and 6.4, as mentioned by Professor Franco Ferrari, and we're going to be looking at the interplay between both of these articles. Um, I'm going to mention one particular case, and then maybe later on in the discussion, we can, we can expand on that. So Article 6.3 basically establishes the foundation that if any party against uh, which a claim has been made does not submit an answer, or if any party raises one or more pleas regarding the scope, the validity, uh, and the existence of the arbitration agreement, or as to whether all claims can be heard in a single arbitration, uh, then uh, this shall be submitted to the arbitral tribunal unless the court submits the matter, sorry, unless the, the Secretary General submits the matter to the court. So basically what we have here, it's two, it, it sets the ground for two basic elements. The first one is that as many of the, of the people who are present here will know much more than I do, uh, is it is for the tribunal to decide these questions by default under Article 6.5. However, there are certain situations where the Secretary General would be in a position to exercise its gatekeeping powers and to decide whether or not to refer the matter to the court for decision under Article 6.4. So basically, there are certain situations where the, the, the Secretary General would not refer the matter to the, to the court, especially if we have jurisdictional objections regarding the arbitrability of the dispute, whether or not a multi-tier dispute resolution clause has been complied with. These are usually matters that are submitted unless there are other issues to be decided. They're submitted directly to the arbitral tribunal. It becomes a bit more complicated when we have, for instance, issues regarding the compatibility of the arbitration agreements, when we have issues regarding non-signatories, or whether we have a pathological arbitration agreement. 
In that case, the Secretary General exercising what I like to call his prima prima facie uh, 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 examination uh, of whether an arbitration agreement and the rules may exist, he would refer the matter to the court for a decision under Article 6.4. So Article 6.4 establishes essentially the prima facie tests that we're going to be looking at. Um, so essentially when we're dealing with these situations and it's very important to, 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 to stress this, we're not making a legal determination. That is for Professor Franco Ferrari, for Professor Cordero Moss, for Professor Arroyo and Professor Tercier to decide, not for us. We're doing a more of a factual determination. We're administrative body, so we're not taking any, any decisions as, 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 to, as to the legal issues, essentially. So when we have a, a, a situation in Article 6.4, we have what I like to call a three let's say step analysis, we would have the Article 6.4 prim prima facie test, and then we have two scenarios are envisioned under Article 6.4.1 and Article 6.4.2. So Article 6.4.1 would deal with a multi-party dispute situation, and Article 6.4.2, it would deal with a uh, uh, multi-contract uh, situation. So not always we would have to carry out an analysis under Article 6.4.1 and 6.4.2. Sometimes it's just enough to deal with Article 6.4. However, I would like to, to maybe uh, discuss one particular case that we have uh, had in the, in, in the team recently, which is uh, particularly interesting because it required uh, 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 an analysis on all of the levels. So basically we had a, a request for arbitration that was based on six contracts. Two were signed, three were not signed, and one draft was not even produced. Uh, respondents, they raised objections on the basis of one of the contracts that was not signed, on the, basically alleging that the negotiations had terminated and, and therefore an arbitration agreement did not exist. And obviously regarding the, the contract that not, not even a draft was produced and therefore they claimed the arbitration agreement did not exist. Um, so basically, the court was invited in the situation to determine whether or not a prima facie agreement under the rules may exist in relation to each of these contracts. So when we analyzed the first contract that we had a draft produced, but it was not signed, we proceeded as usual looking at the factual elements, we looked at the file, the exhibits, the contracts, in order to determine whether or not uh, potentially the parties had entered into negotiations and therefore, even if they had not signed the contract, the matter should proceed uh, uh, for decision by the arbitral tribunal. And in relation to this case, we found a number of, uh, of legal, legal uh, uh, arguments supported, we found emails that were exchanged, and so we were able to determine that essentially, yes, this contract was in the process of being negotiated, uh, whether or not the negotiations were terminated, and whether or not this arbitration agreement existed was for the tribunal to decide, not for us. The situation was a bit trickier when we were looking at the fact that a draft had not even been produced. As a matter of fact, we haven't had a situation like that in the court, uh, at least in the recent times, and so it was, it was uh, harder to decide uh, what guidance we should follow when it came to that. And essentially, in this case, we proceeded as usual by looking at, at, at the factual evidence that we had on, on record. And we determined that uh, uh, th there was elements demonstrating that the parties were in the process of negotiating this contract that was almost on identical terms as the remaining. Um, there was even a, a, an enclosure referring to one of the contracts that was signed, saying that it should follow the same identical terms. That was an arbitration agreement to the ICC rules. And, and so it would appear that the parties were in the process of negotiating such contract. And here what the court decided was, we were not in a position to determine whether or not this, con this contract containing an arbitration agreement existed, but we were in a position to determine that it could possibly exist. There was reasonable doubt that it might exist. So then the matter was uh, obviously proceeded in relation to this one. So um, the point here was that we had a multi-contract and we had a multi-party situation. So obviously what we also had to do was to carry out an analysis under Article 641 and Article 642. So Article 641 essentially says that the arbitration shall proceed in relation to those parties, including any additional party joined under Article 7, with respect which, with which the court is prima facie satisfied that an arbitration agreement under the rules that binds them all may exist. 
And in relation to this point, it's actually interesting to note that the court's position has been to, that it's sufficient that we have at least one arbitration agreement that binds all parties. Uh, and so in this case, we had, we had one of the, the, the arbitration agreements that was signed by all of the parties that bound all of the parties. So we did not have an issue when it came to Article 641. And then in relation to Article 642, which is when we have more than one arbitration agreement, the court has then to look at two basic elements. Basically, it has to look whether the arbitration agreements are compatible that's the first one. And the second one is whether the parties may have agreed that all claims uh, may be heard in a single arbitration. So regarding the compatibility, uh, it doesn't have to be identical. So the arbitration agreements, they don't have to be identical. They need to be substantively compatible. And I think maybe Professor Cordero Moss, that's a point that we can, we can raise later on. Uh, uh, because there are a lot of discussions, especially when it comes to what are the powers of the court when it comes to incompatibilities, uh, can we remedy them, what are the kinds of incompatibilities that we can address, which ones we cannot. In this case, one of the arbitration agreements uh, was silent as to the number of arbitrators, the other arbitration agreements provided for three. The parties subsequently agreed on three, so it was not an issue. Again, the matter proceeded under Article 642. Uh, uh, a. In relation to 642 b, um, it is quite rare for the parties to expressly agree that all claims can be heard in a single arbitration. So what the court essentially does is to look at a set of objective uh, uh, elements that we would look at and examine in relation to the file of the case as to whether we can determine that the parties may have agreed that the, uh, that the claims can be heard in a single arbitration. And for instance, we would look at the date of the contracts, we would look at the parties that signed the contracts, we would look at whether uh, what is the legal relationship between the contracts and whether or not they're part of the same economic transaction. And taken uh, together, with the compatibility of the arbitration agreements, we would also then determine whether or not the parties may have agreed that all claims can be heard under a single arbitration. Um, and I see them running out of time, so maybe I will uh, pass, uh, pass the floor to, to Professor Cordero Moss. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, dear Rafaela. I guess it, it would be great if we can directly indeed jump into the, the discussion with our debater. So, um, Judita, if you would like to directly join in and... Absolutely, thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation, of course. It's always a great pleasure. Thank you for the very interesting um, presentation of uh, the role that the Secretary generally and the, the court have uh, in respect of, uh, of these uh, preliminary questions. Uh, um, you mentioned that uh, it would be interesting to talk a little bit more about the 642A, and indeed it was one of the questions that I had prepared on my list, so, so I, may, uh, I, I, I don't have a lot of questions, I thought that it would be nice to have some time to discuss them, so, so I eventually come uh, to that. Uh, the first point that I would like to mention is uh, uh, the, the role of the uh, as gatekeeper. Uh, of the uh, Secretary General. Um, you may be aware that uh, we are in the UNCITRAL group, uh, working group uh, two, uh, which is uh, devoted to dispute resolution. We are there discussing right now expedited arbitration and there is this question about early dismissal, which is a little bit, can, can, can somehow uh, be uh, affiliated to these kind of, uh, of questions. And, uh, and the question there is, uh, is it really efficient to permit the parties uh, to ask for an early dismissal, for example, for reasons of lack of jurisdiction or arbitration agreement? Um, is it really very efficient or is it actually creating a procedure within the procedure, which is doing nothing else but multiplying the steps and uh, multiplying the necessity to ask for uh, the parties to comment and so on. And uh, what I think uh, Article 6.3 of the ICC rules uh, has managed to do is to create a sort of compromise between not having the possibility to, uh, to ask for a preliminary or an early dismissal and uh, simply relying on the powers that the arbitral tribunal anyway has uh, uh, discretionary power 
So on the one hand that, on the other hand, uh, we have the possibility to ask uh, for a, a regulator, uh, an early dismissal. And uh, in between there is the compromise by the ICC rules because you have the, 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 um, uh, the role of the secretary general as uh, uh, gatekeeper, which is actually permitting to uh, let through only those requests that uh, may uh, have a certain basis. Uh, always knowing, however, that the last word is not said because it would be the arbitral tribunal and eventually the court itself, the court of law, uh, that will decide those matters. Was this the, the, the thought behind this, uh, uh, this Article 6.3 and the role of gatekeeper or, or was there something, something else behind it? Definitely, basically, the, the, the role of the, of, the, of, the, of the Secretary General as a gatekeeper was also to try to burden less the court with maybe the referral directly of jurisdictional objections that might lack uh, any basis a priori, so before obviously being submitted to the arbitral tribunal. And I've had a number of cases where definitely it has been more cost and time efficient that the secretary general has the power to do that uh, uh, than, than otherwise. And for instance, I had a recent case uh, involving uh, an African state and it was an infrastructure project quite big. And uh, basically the arbitration agreement uh, indicated that the dispute should be submitted to ad hoc arbitration at the capital of that African state. Uh, and, and, and in short, uh, our role was basically uh, to act as an appointing authority. And had we not had this, the possibility of the of the uh, of the of the Secretary General to to first do a first screening to decide to submit this matter directly to the court, and for the court to then take a decision under Article 6.4, we would make the parties uh, have to deal with a situation uh, that eventually would lead to to to, to the Arbitral Tribunal not having jurisdiction over it because it was not an ICC arbitration agreement. And so, uh, definitely, I, I feel that the role. Of the, of the Secretary General when it comes to that has been to screen those cases that might eventually lead to a negative uh, jurisdiction uh, decision, uh, so a negative Article 6.4, uh, and, to, and, to um, and to essentially save time and money for the parties. On the other hand, it also allows the, the Secretary General to exercise its discretionary power and to submit them directly to the, to the, to the Arbitral Tribunal. Right. So it's a, a, a sound and reasonable use of the discretion of the Secretary General that uh, turns out to be the, the right balance between the two different approaches. I suggest that we jump to the question of uh, 642A, and then if we still have the time, we come back to, to other questions that I have. Um, this is uh, the, the situation where you have uh, multiple agreements, and in particular, letter A is uh, uh, where the court uh, can uh, evaluate to what extent the different agreements are compatible with each other. And you said that uh, compatibility does not necessarily mean that they, the agreements have to be identical with each other. There can be some uh, differences. And, uh, and uh, in the paper, you made some uh, you, you made the difference between the fundamental incompatibilities when there are Sorry. fundamental. What happened? My apologies. It's it's blocking. I'm I'm not sure if I heard you. Sorry. Okay. So I don't know when you stopped. The incompatibilities, fundamental incompatibilities. Fundamental Sorry. incompatibilities that, uh, that uh, the court cannot do anything with, so they cannot force uh, the parties into changing their contract so that they become uh, compatible. And uh, other non-fundamental incompatibilities where the court may have a certain uh, authority to rectify uh, so that the agreements uh, that the parties have entered into so that uh, notwithstanding the, the lack actually of consent, uh, uh, still the court finds that, uh, uh, that there is a common uh, basis for, for having a, a single process. So my question here is uh, where exactly goes the line between fundamental and non-fundamental? And, and isn't it really a very dairy 
role to have for the court to, to decide that, yes, I know that the parties did not agree that, but I think they should have. And then you rectify their contract and you start a proceeding on that basis. Is, is it really a sound basis? Doesn't the award in the end run the risk of being set aside or not enforced? The examples that you are making in the paper of non-fundamental incompatibilities, they are not really incompatibilities because you are saying, for example, one contract say one says one arbitrator, the other contract says one or three arbitrators. That's not really an incompatibility because both contracts have actually said one arbitrator. And then in addition, there is one that permits also three. There was another example that was similar that I forgot. Uh, so, so my question is here, where do you draw the line between what is fundamentally incompatible and what is only incompatible and can be rectified? Exactly. And I think you, you touched exactly on, on the right points, which is exactly, for instance, if we have a situation where we have two arbitration agreements and we have one that establishes the place of arbitration, whereas the other one doesn't, then that's not an incompatibility because the court under the rules has the power then to fix the place of arbitration and it can uh, remedy that. Now, we have a much uh, bigger issue when, for instance, we have two arbitration agreements uh, and one establishes uh, that the court shall, for instance, uh, uh, appoint the president of the arbitral tribunal and we have another that the core arbitrators must uh, jointly nominate the president. The question here is whether or not the court would be able to come in and, and step in and, and, and remedy that. And, and our position in previous decisions is that we do not have the power to do that because we would be essentially modifying the parties agreement as you rightly pointed out. Uh, we had recently another case which uh, if I'm not mistaken, we had two or three situations so far, uh, which re refers to the applicable rules, whether or not the fact that our the arbitration agreements on which the requests are based refer to different applicable rules, whether that would be an incompatibility and whether or not the court would be able to remedy that. And we had recently a case in our team where it was three arbitration agreements, two made reference to the 2017 rules and one made reference to the 2012 rules. And, and, and the court was then invited uh, to, to, to determine whether uh, respondents' jurisdictional obje objections were justified uh, and whether or not this was an incompatibility. And here we determined that it would be essentially the same issue it was an issue of consent. We did not have the power to step in. We did not have the power to modify the party's agreement when it came to the applicable rules. Even if when we're looking at the 2012 rules and the 2017 rules, they are not that different. So, I mean, in, in particular, in, in, in this situation, in this case, no issues were going to arise out of it. For instance, it was not an EPP case, so we're not going to have that issue later on. So, so uh, it was not like looking at the 1998 rules and the 2012 rules, for instance, where the differences might be considered bigger. Uh, but in any event, the court's position was that uh, uh, we were not in a position to remedy that. Um, and, and Essentially, as you mentioned, we do not have the power to modify the party's consent. Yeah, yeah. thank you. I think it's a very wise, uh, or maybe very conservative, but I think it's a very wise uh, policy. I see Alexander is a getting a little bit nervous. Uh, do we still have time or? Uh... Um, so we have actually five minutes. So what I suggest is maybe um, if you have any, I, I know that uh, Franco had a, a question that, and he maybe wanted to, to intervene as well. So maybe let's open up, um, but obviously, um, if you have any, any further questions first, uh, I'd like to, to keep you. No, 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 absolutely. <laughs> Franco, go ahead, and if we have time, then mine, I mine is actually not as much a question as a suggestion. Um, Rafaela, when you presented your paper, you referred to, and I quote, prima prima facie. And look, in an exit case I was sitting at, I did use a different term, but, with certain implications. I used the concept of primissima facie in a 41.5 setting. 41.5 setting uh, means, of course, basically early dismissal under exit rules. Why primissima facie? Because I believe that the depth into which the arbitral tribunal has to go in order to decide the 41.5 um, request is different from even a prima facie look at certain kind of things later into the 
um, arbitration. So I wonder whether you want to, um, whether you are referring really to a primissima facie, which in my opinion means something even less to be looked at than a prima facie analysis or yeah. prima, prima facie, I mean, prima facie standard, but before you go to a certain step. But the standard would be, in your case, in my opinion, the same. In my case, it would be different. No, we, no I, I essentially meant just that the Secretary General would obviously carry out an analysis under Article 6.4, uh, although not probably as in-depth as the court, because obviously we would then later on invite the party's comments. Uh, but no, I did not mean uh, 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 in the same context as you. I see that at this stage, we don't have any questions in the chat. So if that is, um, if that is okay. So I, I had one question I wanted to ask to Rafaela, um, which is about the, the um, reasons that are communicated uh, when there is a decision, actually. I just wanted to know what the dynamic is there because I understand that they're not communicated, but obviously as a tribunal, when you know that there has been a decision, um, you might want to have access to that information. So I just wanted to have your view exactly from the inside of what actually goes, uh, goes out in terms of information. No, so actually Article 6.4, uh, 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 the parties may request for uh, the court to provide reasons. Under the 2017 rules, it is not necessary anymore for uh, both parties to agree, as long as one party submits the request, and if that request is submitted before the decision is taken. However, the court still remains, uh, it still retains the discretionary power to, to render or not these reasons. Uh, on the basis of our experience, more often we, we do, uh, obviously, for the sake of transparency, uh, issue the, the reasons, unless it is a very highly sensitive case that uh, we decide not to take that approach. Okay, thank you. Um, I think considering the time now, I will leave open the possibility for, for anyone in the audience to, to ask a question via the chat. And I'd like to uh, move on to the second presentation now um, so that we are strict on the, on the schedule and invite uh, Lucas um, to, to give his, uh, his presentation. Thank you for starting off the discussions, Rafaela and Professor Cordero Moss. Thank you, Professor Ferrari and Alexandre for the introductions. And thank you to everyone for joining us for this virtual conference. It's a pleasure to be here with you. As Professor Ferrari mentioned in his introduction, our second discussion centers around Article 3 of the New York Convention. Broadly speaking, Article 3 allows states to apply their own rules of procedure in proceedings for the recognition or enforcement of arbitral awards. It is uncontroversial that Article 3 gives states considerable freedom to decide on procedure relating to how an arbitral award is to be enforced. For example, if a state so wished, it could even say that the party seeking to enforce the arbitral award must fill out a prescribed form with green ink, print it on pink paper, and file it by 10 a.m. in the morning, so long as these procedures are not substantially more onerous than those applicable for the enforcement of domestic awards. The problem is that some domestic rules of procedure, when applied, do not merely relate to how the award is enforced, but rather whether the award is enforced at all. These include rules on personal jurisdiction, statutes of limitations, and forum non-convenience. There are others, but I'll be focusing on these three rules to illustrate my arguments today. And the question is, does Article 3 allow for the application of these kinds of procedural rules? In my presentation, I will outline three possible interpretations of Article 3 with three different answers. For interpretation one, the answer is no. Article 3 cannot justify using procedural rules to deny the recognition and enforcement of arbitral awards. The scope of the phrase rules of procedure in Article 3 is thus limited to filing requirements, fees, and other such minor matters. This is perhaps the view that comes most intuitively to many arbitration practitioners because it is often said that the seven grounds for non-enforcement in Article 5 of the New York Convention are exhaustive. The problem here is that many states do in fact have procedural rules in place that could prevent the recognition or enforcement of arbitral awards. For example, many states have rules on personal jurisdiction and will not enforce an arbitral award if the award debtor 
does not have a sufficient connection with the enforcing state. Similarly, a 2012 study by the International Chamber of Commerce found that almost 80% of the 79 countries surveyed imposed limitation periods on the commencement of proceedings for the recognition and enforcement of arbitral awards. Therefore, the only way this narrow construction of Article 3 can be squared with reality is to say that these procedural rules fall within one of the grounds found in Article 5 of the New York Convention for not enforcing an award. The only ground on, for which this is possible is Article 5, Paragraph 2b, which is the notor notoriously amorphous public policy exception. However, the public policy exception is meant to be used only in exceptional circumstances where the enforcement of the award would violate the enforcing state's most basic notions of morality and justice. And it is perhaps for this reason that, to my knowledge, no court has considered rules on personal jurisdiction or time limits to fall within the ambit of the public policy exception. Even if courts were to tread this path, it is likely that different states would have different stances on which procedural rules embody the state's most basic notions of morality and justice. And this would create undesirable uncertainty for parties seeking to enforce arbitral awards. I turn then to the second possible interpretation of Article 3, and here the answer is yes. Article 3 does allow for procedural rules to be used to refuse the recognition or enforcement of arbitral awards. Furthermore, under this interpretation, what constitutes a rule of procedure that can be applied under Article 3 is to be determined solely based on the domestic, on the enforcing state's domestic law. This is illustrated by the 2011 case of Figueredo, Faraz, and Peru, where the US Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit refused to enforce an arbitral award against Peru on the ground of forum non-convenience. Forum non-convenience is a discretionary doctrine that allows the court to dismiss the case where there's another forum better suited to hear the dispute. The court reasoned that since the US Supreme Court had classified forum non-convenience as a procedural doctrine, it was applicable to arbitral enforcement proceedings by virtue of Article 3. This case highlights two problems with putting a domestic spin on what constitutes a rule of procedure under Article 3. First, it would detract from the New York Convention's goal of increasing uniformity and promoting the enforceability of arbitral awards, because doctrines which exist only in some states and not others may be used to deny the enforcement of arbitral awards. Forum non-convenience, which is largely non-existent in civil law jurisdictions, is one such example. And many commentators have suggested that its application in the Figueredo case was a violation of the US's treaty obligations. Second, it can be difficult to determine whether domestic law classifies a rule as procedural or substantive. Reasonable minds have disagreed over such issues, and the classification of a rule may even change based on the context in which it is applied. For example, it has been argued that forum non-convenience should be considered procedural only in purely domestic cases. Thus, under interpretation two, it may be difficult to predict ahead of time whether a state will consider a rule procedural or not, and how to make decisions about where to enforce one's arbitral award. I turn then to the third possible interpretation of Article 3, which I see as a good middle ground between the first two interpretations, and which can address most of the concerns that have been raised thus far. This third interpretation is that Article 3 does allow for the application of rules of procedure that would have the effect of denying recognition of an or the enforcement of an arbitral award, but only where either, one, the rule is widely applied among contracting states in enforcement proceedings, or two, the application of the rule significantly furthers some interest or policy of the forum state. The first limb of this approach is based on the customary rule of treaty interpretation that the subsequent practice of contracting states in the application of the treaty is to be taken into account when interpreting its provisions. Thus, the fact that the majority of contracting states to the New York Convention have domestic rules on personal jurisdiction or limitation periods, which are applicable to arbitral enforcement proceedings, would allow for these rules to be applied as a rule of procedure under Article 3 of the New York Convention. This ensures that states will not be required to uproot long-standing rules of procedure 
in order to comply with their New York Convention obligations. On the other hand, the same cannot be said for less common doctrines, such as foreign non-convenience, which is largely absent in civil law jurisdictions and has not been frequently applied to enforcement proceedings, even in common law jurisdictions. We would thus have to look at the second limb, which is whether the application of forum non-convenience would significantly further some interest or policy of the forum state. The answer here would likely be no, which is perhaps why its application in enforcement proceedings has been so heavily criticized by commentators in the first place. Forum non-convenience is meant to ensure that courts are not overburdened with cases that could more easily be resolved in another state and avoid prejudice to a defendant which arises from having to defend a long drawn out suit at an inconvenient location. However, these concerns are minimal in the context of enforcement proceedings where the merits of the case have already been decided and the proceedings are meant to be brief. Therefore, under the third interpretation, a court would likely conclude that foreign non-convenience is inapplicable under Article 3 of the New York Convention. This second limb forces courts to confront the question of whether procedural rules that were developed in a domestic setting and which can prevent the enforcement of arbitral awards continue to serve their function in the context of arbitral enforcement proceedings. The scope of what rules of procedure are applicable under Article 3 thus becomes considerably narrower, which is in line with the New York Convention's goal to increase the enforceability of arbitral awards subject to a minimum number of conditions. It is my hope that this practical approach to Article 3, which allows states to continue applying essential rules of procedure while limiting the application of unnecessary rules which hinder enforcement will help to ensure the continued success of the New York Convention and, the, and international arbitration. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear, dear Lucas. And I guess I will directly give the floor to, to Judita um, to have the, the response from our debater. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very interesting uh, presentation. Um, there are many, uh, many, many, many uh, different things that uh, that uh, that can be said on this topic, and uh, you really manage to to uh, express a lot of the issues that are uh, discussed, and uh, some of them are unresolved. And uh, um, basically, there is this uh, dichotomy between, on the one uh, hand, you have uh, uh, you want to avoid using Article 3 for uh, smuggling um, additional grounds uh, for uh, refusing enforcement, additional to those that you have in Article 5. Uh, this is one thing that you want to do. Um, on the other hand, you don't want to deprive the national law of the role that it has under Article 3. Uh, so, so the question is uh, how to find a, a middle uh, way between these two extremes. Uh, and uh, I have always thought of uh, uh, the references that you have to national law in the New York Convention. I always thought that they were the expression of a balance, some, like sort of a break even uh, between the state's willingness to be open and accept and enforce all the awards uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, the necessity to safeguard a certain, uh, uh, certain, a certain role for the national law. So what I think I can observe is that uh, uh, if the references to national law contained in Article 5 uh, are uh, threatened, then courts might have a tendency to react by restricting the scope of arbitrability. So they feel that uh, awards are good and acceptable as long as we have a certain role for national law, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, regulated in the references to national law in Article 5. I'm talking about Article 5 now. And uh, as soon as those references there are threatened, then uh, courts may start uh, interpreting the scope of arbitrability more expansively or, or restrictively uh, so, so, so that uh, there are uh, fewer possibilities to go to arbitration because they are scared that their national law is not going to be uh, to have the role that, uh, that they were expecting to have. So 
um, restricting the role of national law under Article 5 can prima facie or primissima facie can look like it is uh, uh, arbitration friendly, but in the end it is not. It obtains the opposite because it provokes courts uh, to restrict the scope of arbitrability. My question is, do you think that there may be a similar reaction if you start saying that the reference to the national law that you have in Article 3 is not really to national law in its totality, the procedural, but it is only to those rules that are necessary. And, uh, and then it's uh, up to the international community to decide which rules are uh, particular to a, a country and can be discarded and which other rules are more important. Do you think that that could uh, create some reaction to the willingness uh, to accept arbitrability? I think it is possible and I definitely agree with your assessment that if you try to be too restrictive on states that they could find backdoor ways to reduce the scope of arbitrability and uh, other ways to hinder the arbitral process. I don't think that this will be um, too big a problem if we try and crack down on procedural doctrines such as the foreign non-convenience or this pendants, which um, arguably don't serve their full purpose in the context of um, arbitral enforcement proceedings. And there have been cases, uh, for example, the 1992 decision in Priva Legietta, which was decided by the Italian Supreme Court, which held that this the Liz pendants rule should not be applied to state proceedings uh, when someone was trying to enforce an arbitral award that was rendered in London. And one of the reasons that it gave was that it was simply unnecessary to apply Liz pendants in relation to arbitral enforcement proceedings. And they said that while Liz pendants ordinarily avoids the risk of conflicting decisions by ensuring that the same case is not heard in multiple fora, under the New York Convention, uh, court proceedings must be stated if there's a valid arbitration agreement and thus the court ruled that such a conflict would be impossible. And so I think that courts are willing to accept that certain doctrines uh, can be foregone in the context of enforcement proceedings, which are brief and of a different nature from your regular case where you need things such as foreign non-convenience. And there's the other reason why I included the second limb of the test, uh, the third interpretation, where a state can continue to apply its procedural rules if there's some policy or interest of the state that is furthered by the application of that procedural rule. This was specifically designed uh, so that states wouldn't try to limit arbitration in other ways. For example, by increasing the scope of the public policy exception or the uh, non-arbitrability exception. Could an alternative way of obtaining the same, uh, the same more or less result, uh, could it be rather than saying it's only that part of national law that uh, is common to a plurality of systems uh, that applies under Article 3 and not the other parts uh, which are peculiar. Uh, could you say that it's only those parts that are, uh, uh, that have the function of uh, following up the process until enforcement of the award and it's not those uh, rules that uh, uh, th that uh, relate to characteristics of qualities of the award itself. So would it be possible to say that Article 3 uh, makes reference to the national law, uh, procedural, but uh, in its totality, also if they have a very peculiar rule on pink paper, for example, I liked that rule that you mentioned. So, so could that be uh, to say that it refers to, to national law, but only to those parts of the national law that uh, uh, relate to the enforcement proceedings. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just thinking of a situation where sometimes it happens that an, an arbitral award has to be enforced uh, uh, against a party who is under insolvency proceedings. And insolvency proceedings, uh, they can be regulated by very strange peculiar rules on with pink paper and that kind of, uh, within 10 o'clock in the morning and that kind of requirements uh, that you mentioned. Uh, if you start saying that um, 
that uh, an arbitral award cannot be enforced against that uh, insolvency proceedings, insolvency rules cannot be, enfor uh, cannot be applied against an insolvent party when there is an arbitral award involved because the insolvency rules have, are special for that particular country and they are not common to all the other countries. That starts getting very invasive in the, uh, th that starts uh, threatening a lot to the integrity of the insolvency rules. Because the, 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 the point would be that the award is enforceable because we have an award and we have to enforce it and there are no grounds under Article 5 that say that you can't enforce it but it has to be enforced in accordance with the insolvency rules according to Article 3. So that if the insolvency rules say that all the awards that have been filed after 10 o'clock, uh, no, not the awards, all the claims that have been filed after 10 o'clock, uh, they will be paid only 90%, then the award would also need to be subject to those rules. Um, uh, so, so the idea then would be not to qualify the reference to national law by looking for the characteristics of the national law under Article 3 that are common to all the other countries, but it would be to qualify the application of Article of national law under Article 3 by reference to the purpose of enforcing the award and nothing else. I don't know if I made if, if I made my point. Um, so just to make sure I understand the question, I think. You were saying that uh, you are worried that the quality of the award might not be um, what is expected if we don't apply all the procedural. No, not not the quality of the award. No, I'm thinking that Article Three makes reference to national law for the procedure of enforcement, and uh, I would like to make sure that uh, national law is applied to the procedure of enforcement in its totality, also the rules that are particular to that particular countries and are not common to all the rest of the, uh, of the business community. Um, but only those rules that are instrumental to enforcement. So you should not use Article 3 to smuggle in uh, jurisdiction questions like forum non-convenience or something like that, because those are not rules that are directly linked to the enforcement of the award. But if there are some peculiar rules, for example, in the insolvency, when you have to enforce against a party who is under insolvency proceeding, then you should actually be able to rely on the totality of the insolvency, local insolvency rules for the purpose of enforcing the award. What I'm thinking also is that uh, the, the idea that uh, there should be some sort of autonomous interpretation of Article 3 so that uh, the national law is applied to the extent that it is common to, to uh, it has rules that are recognizable in other countries in the international community. Assuming that will ensure an equality of treatment between among all the international awards, but it may create a disparity of treatment between international awards and domestic awards. And we know that there are many countries where domestic and international arbitration is actually treated in the same way. So that it's not necessarily only um, positive to ensure that uh, there is a harmonization towards internationalization. So, uh, to the first part of your uh, question, I think I agree with you that so long as the rules um, don't outright prevent an arbitral award from being enforced, such as those jurisdictional questions on forum non-convenience, that it, the state would have the, the, the discretion to apply uh, insolvency rules wholesale. Uh, they can, of course, modify these rules if they think that it's not suitable for international arbitration uh, context, but they are, they are free to apply those rules in their entirety, so long as they don't prevent the enforcement of an arbitral award. And for the difference about perhaps discriminating against international arbitral awards compared to domestic ones, I think that there is some discretion for states to do that because Article 3 says that you can impose conditions so long as they are not substantially more onerous than those which are applicable to domestic proceedings. But of course, um, it's sort of a gray area and we will never 
fully know when it becomes substantially more onerous. But uh, I do agree, of course, that if there's no good reason to, that you shouldn't try to make, uh, make it unnecessarily difficult to enforce international awards. Alexander, are we... I, I guess, yes, because I, I would like to open up just, because uh, I know I have a question from Diego, I have a question also from uh, Franco. So I, I suggest uh, perhaps Franco, you, you would like to... Just one thing, and it goes um, into the direction of what Judita mentioned and what Lucas discussed in the paper. So the way I see it, but this is true also, and I'm talking um, to Judith at this point, also in relation to Article 5 when reference is made to domestic law. The idea is to have an autonomous concept of procedure. Forget the Article 3 now, what it says, that you can go to domestic law. I think also in relation to validity issue mentioned in 5.1a, you have an autonomous concept, as hard as it may be to identify an autonomous concept of procedure under Article 3 of validity, um, of incapacity and so, or capacity, um, again, under Article 5. So you have an autonomous concept. What the judge then should do when seized with a recognition or enforcement action is to wonder, hmm, I have a rule in this country that is qualified as procedure, such as forum non-convenience. Does my domestic procedure rule of forum non-convenience fall under what is to be considered an autonomous concept of procedure that the drafters wanted to put forth. In my opinion, at least as far as forum non-convenience is concerned, the answer has to be no, for two reasons. A, because it doesn't fall under this autonomous concept. B, because even in the US, where the decision referred to by Lucas was rendered, forum non-convenience is not used in the enforcement proceedings. The New York Bar Association has written extensively on this exact point, as have some colleagues at NYU, including Professor Silverman. So it was wrong in any case to refer to the forum non-convenience doctrine in enforcement proceedings, period, because that's not what the law um, of that federal court would have said. But I would go further and say the same thing for validity. Validity. Let's take validity. We know that, of course, validity is subject to the law chosen by the parties, absent such choice is a C. But it doesn't mean that everything you can qualify under domestic law as a validity issue can be dealt with on the basis of domestic law, rather a, an autonomous concept of validity, as hard as it is to identify a grant that. And then the judge should say, hmm, what do I do with this particular validity requirement, such as pink paper and green ink? It cannot be, it cannot be that an agreement has to be um, considered invalid just because that parochial rule says so. It's not what validity under Article 5 has to mean. May, may I? May I just very, very shortly, quickly? Um, I, I, I agree. Uh, the, the qualification, the concept, the scope of what is validity, the scope of what is procedure uh, should be interpreted in an autonomous way. But then the content of what is, yeah. And then the green paper, or it was the green ink. And the, I, I'm not sure whether it is, uh, because if there was a rule saying that uh, um, an agreement is an arbitration agreement is invalid if it contains if the tribunal is composed only by women or something like that. No, it's uh, it's not a good example. But, but in any case, if it's a good example, but okay. that, in my opinion, may be of course a good example. But the green ink example is the best example to say the autonomous concept of validity cannot have encompassed that type of idiosyncrasy and cases where only men were on the tribunal have led to non-enforcement in some countries cases where religious uh, groups or where the arbitrators had to take have be taken or from a religious group may have led to problems that's a difficult but this best example is a pink ink 
paper and green, um, green ink, uh, whatever. Th th that's a form requirement. I'm not sure it's a form requirement. Because if the law says it's invalid, it's not just a form requirement. But if it, if it violates form requirements, it's invalid. If it violates form requirements, I would say Article 2 overrides it. Look at the check. Yeah, look at you're right. Different kind of things. Yeah. I think I'm going to give the floor to, to Diego for, for the final question now, um, and then we will be able to. No, I uh, thank you very very much, Lucas. I, I, I found your your paper really interesting and, and and with many ideas behind. But I have two problems with your interpretation. That I I, I find that the interpretation really persuasive. But I have two problems. One is a, a contradiction with the very finality of the convention because the, the convention. It's not just a convention to, as you know perfectly, not to regulate recognition and enforcement. It's to promote recognition and enforcement. And that is clearly put in, in the explanation of the convention, but also in, in Article 7, that is really 7, paragraph 1, it's clearly that it's not uh, everything which is uh, against the recognition and enforcement should be removed because the, the the very finality is to have the uh, universal circulation of uh, uh, of awards. The second problem uh, I have is is more in in the uh, in the explanation you you gave concerning the common interpretation. You say well the common rules on interpretation of treaties say there is a practice which is common in, in several countries or in the majority, I don't know, a, a number of countries which are contracting states, uh, that can, must be taken as a parameter, no? as, as a standard for interpretation. However, uh, the limit is, again, is which is the finality of the convention. So, and, and that re reminds me of many conventions, but uh, for example, nothing to do with that. When, but for example, in the Hague Convention on Legal Kidnapping, uh, at the beginning when the, the, the convention started to work in, 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 in many countries, um, many countries make a, you can, made a, a wrong interpretation and application of the convention, in particular, Article 13 of that convention. And the Hague Conference could adopt your approach to say, well, the practice is that, so we accommodate the, our text and our finality to what the states are doing. But the, the reaction was exactly the opposite. And, and I, I could say, fortunately, the Hague Conference called the different countries and said, no, 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 it's not like this. It's, you are doing wrong. If you are good rules and you're good practice for you, okay, but that are not applicable under the convention. And I think that some procedural issues applied and some of the examples you, you gave uh, applied in some countries uh, under the appearance of application of the, the New York Convention are simply wrong applications. We can accept uh, as a less, uh, uh, we can say aggressive vis-a-vis -vis the, the contract in the States. Okay, but this, I think it's not a good solution in general in, in international, uh, international Low making. So I understand the concern that, um, of course, states who sign up to the New York Convention are meant to promote the enforceability of arbitral awards. But I think that there's always a balance that we have to strike. And even the inclusion of something uh, such as Article 52B, which is the public policy exception, was meant to recognize the fact that the drafters try to limit the number of exceptions that states could make to enforceability, but they wanted to be sure that there was a sort of a catch-all provision. And that was why they included this vague notion of public policy to recognize that in some situations, although states should exercise their discretion well and uh, confine this, narrow the situations in which that they will refuse an uh, arbitral award, but there are still some cases where you need to make an exception. And I think in the case of uh, 
very commonplace rules such as jurisdiction uh, and time limits, which are found almost everywhere in the world, uh, that would be an appropriate place to make an exception. Well, that, I think that, that that was my following point, but uh, I think it's already too long. If there is, if you can qualify some of that as a, a public policy issues that you cannot accept because it's a problem of public policy, I agree, it's okay. Uh, but if not, it's just a, a rule of procedure which is traditional in your country, you must not apply that. It, it is traditional, okay, but it, that must, uh, I think, must qualify as a very exceptional issue of public policy in order to be accepted, in order to, to, to uh, eliminate the finality of the enforcement of the war. But uh, again, uh, in any event, uh, your, your presentation was wonderful and, and congratulations. Thank you. A minor, a minor disagreement. And surely I'm wrong and you are, you are right. Thank you. So I guess right now with the, with the time, um, as my task is really to keep the organizers, which made us have now five minutes today. <laughs> and I would like to directly give the floor to, to Diego for the, for the next uh, panel. Well, I, I'm sorry to, to take the floor again, but it, it is just to, to thank Carolina uh, and Pierre to be in this panel. And of course, the, the, the speakers, but the speaker will be introduced by, by Carolina. Carolina was one of the first students I had when I, I met when I came to, to Sciences Po, and it was a, a very fruitful relationship since then. And she, said, she was a wonderful student. Then she went to NYU, and it was also a, a good student of Franco in, in, in NYU. And, and she has been very successful in his in her career in arbitration. And she was always collaborating with us in, in teaching in, in Sciences Po, but also is, uh, is uh, an associate in, in, in uh, Clifford Chance in, in Paris. And really, we are very proud of, uh, of her. And Pierre Tercier, this is, I will not introduce Pierre Tercier, but that was ridiculous. But uh, uh, I would like to thank Pierre Tercier because he is always uh, with us, in particular with our students, our students, uh, in particular the LLM and arbitration uh, love Pierre here for good reasons, and also the, the, the students who came for, for the Concours d'Arbitrage. Uh, Pierre has been the, the president of the grand final tribunal for, for a while, and he will be again next year uh, because I was at resolution by acclamation. And uh, the only thing I, I can say, uh, Mr. VPL, is thank you very much uh, once again. Thank you very much, Diego. I'm uh, very happy to be here. And I certainly do not want to take too long, but um, I just wanted to say two sentences on our second uh, topic, which uh, contrary to the first panel, which really focused on two very distinct issues is, um, uh, really focuses on the same general issue, which is the arbitrator's inherent powers. And of course, as we all know, arbitrators derive their powers uh, from various sources, be it the arbitration agreement, applicable, applicable arbitration rules, or uh, the law of the place of arbitration. Uh, that being said, of course, even the most complete arbitration agreement or arbitration rules or national laws cannot potentially cover spell out or enumerate uh, every single situation an arbitrator may face when carrying his or her duties of uh, adjudicating a dispute. And so uh, arbitrators have increasingly uh, exercised powers not expressly uh, conferred by those various sources. And this is generally what we refer to as inherent powers. I'll not give a more detailed uh, definition of it because I'm sure uh, the two Jacks that will present uh, know the topic much better than I do. Uh, but that being said, that's the main framework. Um, and that concept of inherent powers has allowed arbitrators, arbitrators to you know, arrive at decisions such as uh, security for costs, decisions on disclosure of information relating to third party funders, motions for reconsiderations, et cetera, et cetera. And so our two panelists today, uh, focus on two topics uh, under that big heading of uh, arbitrators inherent powers. Uh, we'll her first have Jack Davis, who's an associate in international arbitration at uh, Wilmer Hale in London. Uh, Jack is from New Zealand. He studied law 
uh, at the University of Auckland and completed an NYU LLM. And he'll present on the inherent powers of international tribunals to exclude party appointed expert witness, witnesses, which is a, uh, an exciting and, and uh, very rarely discussed topic. And secondly, we'll have another Jack, Jack Biggs, um, uh, an international arbitration associate at Baker Butts in London. Uh, Jack is uh, originally from Australia. He studied law at the University of Queensland and then completed a master's in um, droit économique at uh, Sciences Po Law School. And he also holds an LLM from Queen Mary University. And so this concludes my very brief introduction. Uh, I'll pass the floor to the first Jack on uh, party appointed witnesses. Uh, well, thank you very much, Carolina. I'd uh, very much like to say what an honour it is to be here speaking. I'd like to thank the organisers, NYU and Sciences Po, um, my supervisor at NYU, Professor Ferrari, as well as Professor Tercier, uh, the moderator, and uh, my co-panelist, Jack. I can't imagine it's very often in international arbitration that one has two Jacks from the Antipodes on a panel. Uh, so as Carolina said, my topic is the inherent power of international arbitral tribunals to exclude party appointed expert witnesses. This was originally the topic for my NYU thesis under Professor Ferrari, and I've also turned it into an article due to be published next month in the International Arbitration Law Review. Obviously, I only have 10 minutes, but I hope in that time to give an overview of why I chose my topic and the main points I make in the article. So as we all know, party appointed experts are commonplace in international arbitration, but their use has also at times been controversial. There are lots of common law court judgments that decry partisan behavior by some experts. And it's likely that there's similar behavior in international commercial arbitration. It's just harder to find examples of this because of confidentiality. There's also confusion around the duties owed by party appointed experts and when these will be breached as most institutional rules are silent on this point. And while in most cases, a party's complaint about the other side's expert can be dealt with in less drastic ways, for example, by attributing that evidence little weight, I wanted to ask whether in more drastic cases, an inherent power to exclude subsists in international arbitral tribunals. So in the article, I first give an overview of the role of the expert, which I probably don't have time to discuss in detail here, before turning to the important concept of inherent powers. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are aware that much scholarship has been written on inherent powers in the last six years, and much of it finds its genesis in the uh, seminal 2014 report produced by the International Law Association. In my article, I explain and describe the report in some detail. I note that the report categorizes what it calls the non-enumerated powers of tribunals into three categories. First, powers that are implied by express provisions set out in the sources of law governing a particular arbitration. Secondly, discretionary powers of procedure. And thirdly, the truly inherent powers, that is powers that are not addressed by other relevant sources of law, but which are quote, necessary to safeguard a tribunal's jurisdiction and the integrity of its proceedings, end of quotes. I explain in my article why I believe it is unhelpful to consider the first two categories as inherent powers, and why in my view, only the association's third category should be regarded as uh, legitimately inherent. What is particularly relevant though in that report is that my survey of the relevant literature shows a consensus as to when an inherent power will subsist. And this consensus aligns with what the ILA says in its report. The general rule I derive from the uh, literature and authorities is that an inherent power will exist only when that power is necessary for the tribunal to fulfill its basic function as an adjudicatory body. And that criterion of necessity is important to be cognizant of, particularly in this area of excluding uh, party appointed expert witnesses, where a party is essentially seeking to limit the other party's right to prove its case in the manner it sees fit. And as noted earlier, one needs to be alive to the possibility of using less drastic remedies to solve the relevant problem. I then turn in the article to relevant jurisprudence and unfortunately I only found one English language arbitration case in which a party applied to exclude the other side's experts from the proceedings, 
but I found a foreign language case as well as two famous English language cases, Havatska and Rompatrol, where a party applied to have opposing counsel excluded. I canvass those decisions in my article and derive principles, which I then apply later when assessing whether a power to exclude party appointed experts subsists uh, for various complaints. And those principles from the case law are as follows. First, the question of whether any inherent power can be used to disqualify an expert should only be considered if there is no express power allowing for disqualification or if no power can be implied from the laws governing the arbitration. Secondly, if a tribunal finds it does have a power to exclude the party appointed expert, that power should only be used in very compelling circumstances. Thirdly, when assessing whether a power to exclude subsists, one needs to bear in mind the practicalities of international arbitration, where various counsel and experts work closely together. And fourthly, as noted previously, one always needs to consider the availability and propriety of other less drastic remedies. I then looked at the grounds on which a party may seek to have the other side's expert excluded and thought uh, the various complaints can be categorized into two main allegations. First, an allegation that centers on the behavior of the expert, what one might otherwise call the misconduct ground. And secondly, complaints that allege a conflict of interest or another risk of apparent bias, regardless of anything the expert may have actually done when preparing their evidence. I then went through and weighed the various complaints against the general test that it must be that the relevant power must be necessary for the tribunal to fill its adjudicatory function and also weigh the um, possible existence of a power to exclude against other less drastic remedies, as well as the other party's right to advance its case how it sees fit and to appoint the experts it wants to. So looking at that first group, misconduct, I thought this ground can be further defined into three more specific complaints. First, that the expert is essentially acting as a hired gun. In my view, a, a power to exclude will not usually be necessary here. My only caveat is where the pro tribunal proposes to attribute no weight to the evidence because it's that bad, which might amount to de facto exclusion of that expert. In my view, in such circumstances, the tribunal would be well advised to raise this with the parties directly. Secondly, that the expert has not carried out their task with an appropriate degree of skill or care, or has otherwise not followed a reliable method. In my view, this generally goes to the quality of the evidence and can be remedied by attributing the evidence little weight and deliberations. And thirdly, improper delegation of the expert's function to the lawyer in that the expert essentially has the lawyer as a ghostwriter. In my view, in many circumstances, such complaint can often be remedied by attributing the evidence little weight. But I suggest that in some cases, the delegation of the expert's task will be so egregious that the lawyer's actions in assuming the expert's role can only be described as offensive to any adjudicatory body seeking to do justice between the parties and a power to exclude must subsist in, um, in these circumstances. And then secondly, looking at the uh, conflict of interest ground, again, I think complaints under this heading can be further delineated into four specific complaints. First, a true conflict of interest um, in the sense that the expert has a pecuniary or other specific interest in the resolution of the dispute. In my view, a power to exclude must subsist on this basis, although one would hope that tribunals would seldom have to address such complaints. Secondly, where the expert has given prior service to or has a prior relationship with the party that has retained the expert, I don't think a power to exclude should subsist on this ground. Uh, if, the, if, the, if there is a conflict or a relationship, then that can be remedied by attributing it less weight. Thirdly, where the expert has given prior service to or has a prior relationship with the objecting party, in my view, a power to exclude should subsist in certain circumstances here, but will depend on the facts of the case. For example, if the expert is aware of confidential information relating to the other party. And finally, where the expert has given prior service to or has a prior relationship with a member of the tribunal. And in my view here, the IBA's guidelines on conflicts of interest should be used as a guide as similar concerns were raised where an expert has a relationship with a member of the tribunal as where counsel has a relationship with a member of the tribunal. 
And then just very, very quickly, uh, there was one final ground, which in my view does not fit naturally into either of those two categories, which is that the expert has a lack of qualifications or is otherwise unqualified to act as expert in the particular case. And in my view, there's probably no power to exclude uh, on that basis. Uh, and any deficiency there can be remedied by attributing the expert's evidence little weight. So that's an overview of my article. Thank, thank you very much for listening to me. Um, and I look forward to discussing uh, those points uh, later. Many thanks, Jack. Uh, and so I think we'll continue with uh, our second presentation right away and then give the floor to Professor Tercier. Uh, so our second panelist is the second Jack. And he'll discuss um, the topic of the arbitrator's inherent powers for dealing with uh, disruptive parties. Jack, please go ahead. Well, thank you very much, Carolina. And I, I echo uh, the other Jack's thanks, um, both to the organizers um, and to the fellow um, panelists. Um, this is a great opportunity and I'm um, very much looking forward to speaking. And in particular, a big thank you to Professor Tercier for, for participating um, this afternoon. Um, as Carolina noted, I'm going to speak about the idea of the arbitrator's inherent powers for dealing with disruptive parties. Now, as I'm sure we all have heard um, and, and perhaps accept, in recent years, parties to arbitration proceedings have become increasingly concerned by two trends. First of all, the disruptive conduct of opposing parties. And second of all, what is often called due process paranoia exhibited by some arbitrators. Now, turning to the first of those two concerns, the 2018 Queen Mary International Arbitration Survey revealed that the second largest problem, according to respondents behind cost, was the, quote, lack of effective sanctions during the arbitral process for uncooperative or disruptive parties. Regarding the second concern, uh, due process paranoia, as, as I'm sure we all know, describes a reluctance by tribunals to act decisively in certain situations or fear of the arbitral award being challenged on the basis of a party not having had the chance to present its case fully. Indeed, I would propose that the two problems have essentially been exacerbated by parties in the former category seeking to take advantage of arbitrators in the latter category. So while I would contest that it is accepted that these two above mentioned problems exist and they should be addressed, um, I will contend that arbitrators inherent powers for dealing with those scenarios will play a very limited role in solving these uh, problems in the future. And so before I turn to those specific problems, I guess it's important to address the two main concepts within um, this premise. The first being, you know, what is you know, an arbitrator's inherent powers? Um, and I echo um, what, what my co-panelist Jack has already said in relation to the 2014 ILA report, which I suppose has really um, promoted a, a discussion of this topic um, in, in, in this field. Um, and I, I would also agree with Jack's conclusions that when we look at the idea of powers that are not expressly conferred, um, and again, as the report says, you have you know, implied powers, discretionary powers, and what the report calls truly inherent powers, um, I, I do agree uh, with Jack's conclusion that only that third category of what, of the, what the report calls truly inherent powers should be considered um, inherent powers, and I have proceeded on that basis in, in this presentation. Now, as the report says, such powers are so core to the function of arbitration that they might properly be termed arbitral duties, the fulfillment of which is a necessary function of serving as a competent arbitrator. Now, again, as, as already flagged, there are different approaches to, I suppose, um, determining um, exactly what an inherent power is. Some focus on the source of the power, the idea that they are fundamental powers that are not otherwise expressly granted, whether it be in the arbitral rules or the, the, the relevant um, national laws that may apply to an arbitration agreement and or seat. While others focus more on the nature of the power, 
and have argued that you know, fundamental powers are necessary for arbitrators to fulfill their duties, irrespective of whether they are granted, um, granted elsewhere. Um, now, I understand that this is obviously a topic of great debate. Um, I would contend though that my, my thesis is unaffected um, by both definitions, though I will proceed on the basis, as I said, that when we're looking at inherent powers, what we are looking at are core unwritten um, powers that arbitrators may have um, for um, uh, you know, discharging, discharging their duties. The second concept then is the idea of disruptive parties. Um, now, often, though not always, respondents you know, do not have an interest in moving cases forward quickly. And so they may engage in all sorts of, of different guerrilla tactics, which you know, we're all no doubt very familiar with. I suppose the two key points to make though um, is that we're talking about scale. There's obviously a difference between a party deliberately missing a deadline to slow down a process um, and at the other end of the scale, uh, bribing an opposing party's witness. Um, so that's one consideration that I think it's important to bear in mind when we look at the, the issue of disruption. And the other key issue is, I guess we have to bear in mind, and this does make the arbitrator's job more difficult, is to determine when a party engages in disruptive conduct um, or exercises their procedural rights to, for example, challenge an arbitrator, to determine whether such conduct is genuinely motivated, perhaps motivated by, by ignorance if they're, if they're not familiar with, with you know, the procedures in international arbitration, or motivated purely on the basis that it will slow and disrupt um, the course of proceedings. So with those conclusions or those, I guess, initial thoughts in mind, I want to move on to, I suppose, the main point of of my presentation, which is that despite all of that, arbitrators do have um, inherent powers for dealing with disruptive parties. Um, again, as we know, arbitrators have an inherent power to resolve disputes, or put another way, they have an inherent mandate to render an award and protect the integrity of the process that they are called upon to oversee. And a necessary part of that is to deal with a party that seeks to obstruct the utilization of that power. Um, and this is reflected in, in certain jurisprudence. For example, in the, the case of Limonenko and Turkey, the tribunal held that it must be regarded as endowed with the inherent powers required to preserve the integrity of its own process. That parties have an obligation to participate in good faith and an arbitral tribunal has the inherent jurisdiction to ensure that this obligation is complied with. Now, this was, I, I, I'm sure um, that almost everyone on this, attending this conference would agree with that premise. However, the unknown element, I dare say, is the scope of that inherent power. There's that gray area as to, you know, and again, turning to what my co-panelists spoke about just before, this idea that inherent power must be necessary to fulfill the arbitrator's mandate. And I'm sure if, if we did a snap poll, there would be an array of differing opinions amongst those on this call as to what is strictly necessary for an arbitrator to fulfill its mandate to, to render an award um, and resolve the dispute put before it. Um, and so I think that gray area is one of the reasons why both national governments and arbitral institutions have responded by expressly and impliedly granting arbitrators broad procedural discretion um, to deal with disruptive parties. Um, because obviously, you know, the, the big fear in all of this is that should a part, uh, an arbitrator rely and I dare say this applies as well for the, you know, when exercising an express power, there is a constant fear, I suppose, of overstepping the mark and then there being an excess of power and thereby, um, you know, exposing the final award to the risk of either being annulled and or um, not enforced. So as, as noted by one scholar in this area, quote, there is little room for inherent powers 
when dealing with disrupted parties. Um, as I'm sure we've all seen, this broad procedural power um, granted to arbitrators to conduct proceedings in an efficient manner, um, to conduct proceedings as they see fit, is reflected in all the main um, institutional rules um, and it's reflected in all the main uh, national arbitration rules. In particular, I would draw uh, people's attention to the LCIA rules, Article 18.6, which is one of, as far as I can see, the only institutional rules that provides an express power for um, arbitrators to sanction counsel for breaching the general guidelines um, that are provided as an annex to the LCIA rules. Now, despite these, um, these express and implied powers, um, the issues outlined above in relation to due process paranoia, in relation to disruptive parties, have continued to grow. Um, and so I think by extension, there is a chance, the risk, I suppose, that more explicit powers may therefore be required to alleviate the concerns of arbitrators, um, that should they exercise their powers in relation to disruptive parties, um, that any subsequent award may be annulled on the basis that a party was not given equal treatment and or not given the opportunity to present its case. Though I would add that when one reviews the, the, the cases on the case law on this issue, um, that such concerns are not reflected um, in practice. So as a result, um, arbitrators have rarely sought to rely on their inherent powers to address these concerns as they would rather rely quite predictably um, on express or implied powers as they provide, I suppose, a far greater uh, degree of legal certainty um, for decision makers um, in this sphere. And so in closing, I would simply say that while arbitrators have these powers, um, I, I believe they will likely um, play a very limited role uh, in the future um, when arbitrators, as I said, are willing to address disruptive party conduct um, I think they understandably prefer to rely on express and implied powers in institutional rules or, as I said, na national arbitration laws, which are broadly worded um, and provide far more, I suppose, explicit protection or cover for arbitrators when uh, they make rulings, whether it be in relation to deadlines, whether it be in relation to document production um, and so forth. Um, so I think, you know, time will tell as to whether the solution to arbitration's procedural problems is either you know, more explicitly expressed powers for arbitrators when it comes to sanctioning or dealing with um, uh, disruptive conduct, or simply in the alternative, a greater utilization of existing powers by arbitrators uh, when faced with those same circumstances. Um, so with those considerations in mind, uh, I would like to hand the floor back uh, to Carolina and Professor Tercier. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Tercier, would you like to jump in? Yes, if I may. First, I would like to, to thank the organizer and uh, Franco and, and Diego. Uh, you know, one question you may ask when you start is why I have been invited. In my case, it's pretty clear. It is an intergenerational meeting, so I'm the living the evidence uh, that there are also dinosaurs uh, in the in the group, and it's a pleasure for me to see some so uh, young faces in front of me, and of course also very happy because both Jack the first and Jack the second both addressed two sort of question: the theoretical question, what are inherent powers? That's good for the professor that I'm Silan, and secondly, uh, both uh, go on practical questions uh, and a rather difficult question. It will be, of course, difficult to, uh, to address all elements uh, in, in the time at our disposal. My, that first question goes to uh, Jack's first, uh, Jack Davis. You took the risk to define uh, the inner and powers and then asked myself the question, well, I must be a very bad arbitrator. I do not remember that once in my long career, I used inner and powers. Are they really something else than just your second category, if I'm not wrong, uh, implies power, discretion for the arbitral tribunal to conduct the procedure according to the 
general rules and and the principle that should be should be uh, should be respected are there really a special category in my view uh i think the answer to that has to be um yes and i think if you if you have regard as i said to the international law association's report um they uh set out those three categories of what they didn't call inherent powers but non-enumerated powers so first powers implied from other sources of law secondly discretionary powers and then thirdly this category of truly inherent powers um so as i said i, I don't think the first two are properly described as, as inherent i think with the first uh it cannot be said to be a residual or inherent power because if you're implying a power you are having recourse to written law to impl uh to uh Im imply or infer i don't know which one i'm using correctly uh but but that power and, and therefore I, I don't think it can be said to be inherent on that basis secondly as i think um andrea calavaris points out in an article um I think it's wrong to talk about so-called discretionary powers as being inherent. The term discretionary goes to the quality or modality of the relevant power rather than its source. Um, but, but thirdly, I, I do think from what I read when writing my article that there is an academic consensus that there is this residual category of power that can't be found in any of the relevant written laws and which sort of traces its genesis back to uh, the common law courts of, of England um, as this residual authority that that abides within within the tribunal or the court as the case may be so to answer your question yes i i, I do think there is this third uh category would you agree with me that it is a rather narrow category and uh, at the end of the day i i have in my just to to to, to use my experience in two cases uh, i took decisions with my colleagues of course Mm -hmm. uh, concerning the order given to one party to change the 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 council not the expert of the council this was a, a case for you of inherent powers in case it's not published for a professor it's extremely frustrating because there were excellent excellent decisions the first one in ancestral case the second in scc case mm -hmm. in both cases we, we we recognize the power that we have but we decided uh, because we consider it is part of the mandate that we have to conduct the procedure in a way that comes at the end to a fair conclusion, especially uh, that uh, the integrity of the procedure should be should be uh, respected. Mm -hmm. I, for, for you, uh, I, I could have used the word inherent powers and I would have been quoted by you. Uh... Well, so so it sounds to me, if I if if I'm correct, um, that you that you relied on the sort of uh, discretionary power identified by the International Law Association to regulate the procedure and con conduct the proceedings fairly. So so in, in my view, you probably didn't rely on an inherent power. Then you you relied on that second category of power identified by the International Law Association. But th there are cases, for example, the Havatska case. Uh, mm -hmm in which the tribunal did not rely on a discretionary power but relied explicitly on an inherent power to exclude a council i think david milden qc in that case um, and that power was also recognized subsequently by the rom patrol tribunal both both in exit settings so uh I, I, I can't remember, I can't recall off the top of my head whether the exit rules contain one of those general provisions that no. says no. So, so, so they had to have recourse to an inherent power, but, but I, I agree with you that it is probably, that it is preferable to either go to first an implied power or secondly, that general discretionary power to regulate procedure before turning to this third category and i think you're probably right to describe it as narrow and i'd also describe it as a residual category that you should really only look at before you've exhausted every other option okay i will i would ask you to ask the same question my goodness time carolina you're you're intervening if i'm too long uh, but another one case is you in your article you take the case siag versus egypt you remember uh, the case in in with the tribunal decide to go back 
on a decision mm -hmm. that he had already taken, apparently, on the question of jurisdiction. Uh, and I find it interesting, and I can come with an example so far for Jack II in a moment, where, where uh, there are decisions that go rather far, probably that the, that the state court will never take. Uh, but we consider because of the mandate that we have from the parties uh, that, that we have to use it in that case. Mm -hmm. Could you agree with what I'm saying here? Uh, I, in, in the sense that, um, that the power relied on by the SEG tribunal was a, was a discretionary power or... Mm -hmm. um, I, no, I, I, probably here I would say uh, it goes further. It goes really mm -hmm. and they, they take measures on their... Uh, because of the mandate that they have to solve mm -hmm. a case uh, and 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 to, to to use it in a way that probably goes a bit far uh, over what mm -hmm. state court or normal that probably uh, could be uh, with the risk of excess of power that uh, as uh, Jack the Second mentioned. But this could be for me a possibility. Yes, yeah, I I, I would agree with that. Um, and I I also think from memory and forgive me, it's been a while since since I read the decision, but it does. From from memory, it could have been argued that the CAG tribunal was uh, using that second power, sort of the discretionary overall power to regulate proceedings, than explicitly having regard to that third residual power. But but I agree, it was um, it it could arguably be regarded as uh, uh, overreach, if if you will, by the tribunal. Okay, Jack, a second. You can you you have to to add some point on that. Oh, Jack Briggs. I'm, I'm sorry, Briggs. You you. I decide you are Jack Jack the second, but it's not a question of hierarchy. Yeah. Happy, happy to be Jack the second. That that's fine. Um, I I would simply add that I agree that I think it is um a a very narrow, or the the, the scope of inherent powers is narrow, um, and that it should be. I suppose you know, um arbitrators should go to it only as a last resort. Um, because as I said, if, if there is otherwise an express or implied um, power, whether it be under the relevant rules or, or, or law, um, that you, I guess, have greater legal certainty um, that you won't, as I said, find yourself facing either annulment or enforcement proceedings where the relevant national, uh, national court finds that you've that, that in exercising that inherent power, you've gone too far. And as I said, particularly when you're looking at, you know, disruptive parties, because there is such a, a scale and breadth to it, and because there are so many different views on what constitutes disruptive conduct, um, I think it's, it would be prudent to um, rely on more expressed or implied powers uh, wherever possible. Okay, I, I stay with you, uh, Jack II, and I will ask you a question in connection now with one of your main uh, theses. And uh, you, you start by stating uh, there is a sort of, uh, you call it a due process paranoia. Where does it come from? What is your explanation? Why are arbitrators so paranoia? Why? Yeah. I, I think, well, it's... Well, it's funny you should raise this because in, in preparing um, this paper, I'm obviously conscious that I really do not have any experience as Don't an worry. arbitrator facing these scenarios. So what I did was I, I reached out to um, several experienced arbitrators that I do know, and I asked them this very question. Um, and one of the answers that came back time and time again uh, was that many arbitrators, and they said they found themselves in the same position, had faced parties which had basically said, um, if you do not grant us this extension, if you do not grant us this request, et cetera, we will challenge this award. So what? And while that's obviously within their rights to say that, um, the, those arbitrators said that, look, that is something, I guess, you know, that they don't like facing and they don't want to see their awards challenged or found to have been guilty of an excess of powers. So there was a reluctance, um, allegedly among some arbitrators, to, I suppose, um, clamp down on what they see as disruptive conduct. Um, and so that was, I guess, the, I suppose, the, the uh, widespread adoption of that view 
um, is what I suppose is referred to, as I said, as, as due process paranoia. Okay, uh, my, my question was, of course, far, far larger. I think in procedure, you will all, of course, have counsel protesting uh, because you have uh, denied the request. And I say, I object. They say, okay, put it on the, on the, uh, on, on the record. There is an objection. And uh, Philippe Pincel made an extremely interesting article looking at Supreme Court decision from, from England, France, and Switzerland trying to find a single case in which a court has decided to annul uh, an, an award because the arbitral tribunal has used his power. But uh, there are probably something else, and I can understand, especially in the young generation, if I may speak to you, uh, yeah, a bit fear, the fear that something comes. There is another point, sorry for being a bit provocative, is the fact that if you intervene too much, if you are too authoritarian, you will have the risk not to be proposed the next time as an arbitrator. And, uh, you know, this situation is, is still, and I have some very bad example. But I fully agree with you that, uh, if, if it's really your attention, that the arbitrators have a responsibility to intervene and to conduct the case in a way that comes to a result it's not sufficient to say we have to, 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 to act diligently and so forth, but we have to decide. And to decide, you have to say no. What is very easy to say yes, the problem is to say no. And uh, there is a real responsibility for, for arbitrators. That's the point. It's a bit marginal. Yeah, you want to, to add something? No, I, I, as I said, I would completely agree. And, and as you said, I think this um, fear is in many ways misplaced because as you said, you, you referred to um, uh, Philippe Pansol's article about court considerations uh, in relation to the discretion of arbitrators. If one looks also in another sphere to ICSID annulment committee decisions, you likewise see a consistent um, you know, rejection of complaints regarding um, you know, arbitrators exercising their jurisdiction, or, or should I perhaps phrase it the other way around and say that the discretion granted to arbitrators to deal with disruptive parties and more generally to, I suppose, run cases procedurally as they see fit is consistently upheld. Um, and so I would completely agree that there is, um, I suppose, a disjoint between perhaps the fear of arbitrators in relation to this and the reality of how national courts and within the ICSID um, uh, circumstance, the um, ICSID uh, annulment committees, how they face it. And I think with those considerations in mind, I, I would absolutely agree that arbitrators should um, exercise uh, their discretion in relation to these matters uh, with far less fear. I'm so happy to, to, to hear you uh, going in this, and I look forward to seeing the new generation being much more uh, uh, directive and authoritarian. Sorry, uh, Jack, the first, uh, uh, you, you must be extremely frustrated because I have 125 questions and uh, I have just the time looking at uh, Carolina to ask you another question. Uh, coming now to, to, to uh, the problem of the, of the expert, mm -hmm. uh, do you, 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 you consider that uh, you can compare because you did it, but of course in your article much longer than in your presentation, mm -hmm. the situation with, with an expert and the situation, a party appointed expert, by the way, it's not, not the, the other one, mm -hmm. uh, and, and an expert, uh, party appointed expert and a council. And you, you, I had the impression that uh, you said in particular in the question of conflict, but not mm -hmm. only, uh, that uh, the, the, the reasoning made in, in Rampetrol and, and Wovka could be also uh, applied for expert. Is it, uh, am, I, am, am I wrong in interpreting your position like that? Uh, so... You, you can say yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, pro, pro, no, yeah, not, not, not quite. I, I think my position was this. When, when doing a survey of the case law, it was, it was uh, very hard to find relevant arbitration cases that looked explicitly at uh, expert witnesses. Um, and, to, uh, and to some extent, I think the Havatska and Rompetrol 
cases did assist in sort of divining some general principles which might be applied to the topic of excluding counsels or experts. And then secondly, uh, there is the explicit point um, where I think the IBA's guidelines on conflicts of interest uh, is, is relevant. And then that's in the case where the other side complains that the expert has a relationship with the uh, with a member of the tribunal, and in the worst, yeah, and yeah, and so I, I think the factors that are in play in that scenario are similar to the factors that will be in play if the experts are complaining about a relationship between a member of the tribunal and the other side's counsel. Yeah, there is a case recently, by the way, also where you had this conflict apparently that uh, connected to the annulment of the procedure. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know if I may ask a question to Rafaela. Did not the, the revision, she's not with us, uh, did not, no. Uh, so I, I think the, 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 the new rules of the ICC 2021 have a rule on uh, exclusion of uh, counsel. Huh? So it's interesting because it goes from an implied power or, or probably in, in speaking like you, it goes from uh, an inherent powers and an implied powers, and now it will be an express power. It's interesting to see this evolution. Am I wrong, Rafaela? No, you're you're correct. It's going to come into force as of, of January 2021. Uh, so obviously, we we will have to to wait to see how it will unfold in practice. Still. Okay, I see Carolina looking. At me. Uh, no, Professor, I don't want to be. Uh, you are not. <laughs> the, the time police, but I, I understand. Um, Franco has a has a question for our panelists. Uh, rather than a question, um, it is a comment on what Professor Tercier and Jack Bix has said um, recently, and uh, Professor Judita Cordero Moss has contributed as well. Um, we were able, and when I say we, I'm referring to German and an Austrian colleague, <coughs> to publish a book with Kluwer with 19 country reports dealing also with that issue, meaning with due process paranoia. And if I'm not mistaken, paranoia is basically a baseless or excessive suspicion of motives of others. This is where Jack's uh, big practical issue comes in. He said, of course, counsel will tell you, if you do this, we will actually do this and this and this. Yes. But, and here I confirm what Professor Tessier has just said. In real life, it, if you look at these 19 country reports, you will see that there are not a lot of cases where there is reason to have this type of paranoia. So um, this is also why we did this, basically. That was our initial idea. We wanted to verify it. It took us a year and a half. But you are right, Professor Tessie. A lot of people, including me at times probably, have thought that, wow, one has to behave in a given way because otherwise certain things happen. And what is the worst that can happen to an arbitrator? Of course, apart from not being paid, that one's arbitral award is being annulled. So that's where it comes from. But you're right that this book, in my opinion, shows through 19 country reports that this is just that, a baseless suspicion of something that's going to happen that triggers a certain behavior. Good, I have no comment. Thank you for this uh, uh, assistance to one of my session. Carolina, you're, you're the boss. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, unfortunately, I saw we have a few questions from the audience, but I think we're very short on time. Um, so, uh, Diego, would you like to briefly conclude? Yes, well, uh, if, if, you, if you wish to go to one of the questions and, and just say goodbye at the end, because I, I think it's more important to have interaction than, than my, what uh, I had prepared to say. So go ahead, please. I think maybe just, so in, in that case, maybe just one. Uh, one of our uh, participants asked um, a general question as to the inherent powers of an arbitrator. So how far can an arbitrator go in deciding or determining matters? And so the example that has been given is um, in an ad hoc arbitration, for example, if the procedural law includes provisions that the default that in respect of a particular matter so for example the commencement date of the arbitration unless the party 
parties agree otherwise. In the situation where the parties do not agree, can the arbitrator change that default provision uh, and continue with the arbitration as he or she sees fit? Uh, I'm not sure whether uh, Jack Davis or Jack B, do you have any, any thoughts on that? Or Professor Tertier or, or anyone else for that matter, of course. No, no, I leave the floor to the young generation. Go ahead, be courageous. <clears throat> So could you just rephrase it's there was a default provision under which law, sorry? Any law. If there is a default provision um, about something, I don't know, the example given here is the commencement date of the arbitration. And the provision there's a default provision unless the parties agree otherwise. And so in a situation where the parties do not agree, uh, can the arbitrator overcome that default provision and continue with the arbitration? you know, as he or she sees fit. I have a view on that, but I'll let you, I'll let you comment if you, if you have any ideas. I mean, correct me if, I, if I'm interpreting the question wrong, but if, if the question is, can the sort of arbitrator amend a default position under the Lex Arbitrary um, where uh, the relevant agreement hasn't been reached, I, I'd probably think no in in the vast majority of circumstances if the procedural law says one thing i mean i've, I've read a reasonable amount on the inherent powers of arbitrators um recently but no no one's really suggested that uh there's an underlying power to amend if you will um the procedural law governing an arbitration i i i agree with you and i think you know it comes back to the previous discussion on yeah. express powers in a way so if a if something is stated, you know, and formulated or enumerated in writing, whether be it in a national law or arbitration rules or even the arbitration agreement, um, it's not really possible unless, you know, uh, the parties agree to it to um, change that express provision, which, 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 uh, which, you know, uh, is, is, the arbitrator or the tribunal should comply with. If I may just add upon, because it is linked partly to the to the previous uh, uh, panel. Uh, it, indeed, there is a limit somewhere is either in the, uh, the agreement of the parties and uh, uh, coming to, to Article 6 and the compatibility of, of two special rules. Uh, at the time I was in the court, we were very reluctant to, have to, 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 to go too far because there were always a risk, not only an annulment, but especially, and this is also a risk, that the difficulty to enforce it. And uh, uh, if you change uh, the rule or if you go over the rule, then the inherent powers are certainly not sufficient to say you can do whatever you want. Uh, you have to comply with the with the uh, the agreement of the parties, um, and and that could be a limit. I think an important limit, but it's probably another topic. Yeah, and just maybe one comment from me. I think indeed party autonomy is the main limit, and then you know issues like public policy, uh, due process, or or issues of due process considered a, of public policy. So, for example, in France, equal treatment of the parties, things like this. And I think, you know, even if, if even if we are in agreement that arbitrators have some inherent powers to adjudicate the dispute, there is always a framework uh, that need to be complied with. So as, as Professor Tercia said, it's not that arbitrators can do whatever they want. <laughs> uh, Diego, would you would you like to to wrap up? I think we're we're at, it's five p.m. So so. Uh, well, I I have exactly. 32 seconds. So thank you very much. And I think it's enough. It's enough just to say thank you, everyone. I think uh, the first session of our intergenerational arbitration symposium uh, has been really successful, successful for the number of attendees and for the quality of attendees. I, I saw some uh, experienced arbitrators attending uh, such as Alejandro Garro from New York, or Fernando Cantuarias from Lima, Giorgio Sacerdoti uh, from Milan, so, and many young I, I know well uh, from the last years here in Sciences Po or 
otherwise, uh, and then I, I, I really uh, thank all of you, the speakers in, from different generations, and also the, the attendees, the moderators, and especially Franco to be always open to collaborate with, with us. And I hope uh, you will meet us uh, in the next session, hopefully in New York in, in next year. Uh, and in the following years with more universities uh, participating with more people and always with this idea to, to combine the enthusiastic, the, the young enthusiasm and uh, experience uh, in order to put together something interesting to discuss and to debate to, uh, about current topics. So thank you again, thank you very much and, and I'm very grateful for all your wonderful papers and your contributions to the discussion. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. Stay well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks very much.